we're going to continue with our, our series, the Summer Sermon. And uh, this message is, is uh, a unique one. It's the one that Pastor Adam didn't want to do last week. Uh, it's the one that I'm going to do. And, uh, and you know, as, as you're going through scriptures, you every now and then hit scriptures that people would like to avoid. And yet, I think we preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. I, I think that the, the, if the Holy Spirit wanted us to read it, it's it's worth preaching, and so we're going to engage in this today. So uh, uh, just over a week ago, Ainsley and myself were in Chicago to b- take part in the live GL Global Leadership Summit. We were there with Kurt Portis and uh, had the opportunity. They've been trying to get us down for uh, each summer for it, and this was the first summer we, we had a chance. And so so uh, long story, at some point I'll tell you about our, our flight there. It was crazy, crazy. Uh, but we finally got engaged in the conference, and things were going well. And so on the Friday morning, Ainsley and I are going into Starbucks. We're not big breakfast people. We just make sure that we need to have a good coffee and maybe a, a loaf of, of something or a granola bar. And so we make our way in, and, and so it's Ainsley in the way, and then myself and Kurt. And as Ainsley starts to walk ahead, I can see this guy that she's about to pass who's sitting at this table. And the, the guy looks at her, and, I, and I'm, I'm watching this. And he looks at her, and then he does one of these. So my hand reached out and grabbed him by the throat and looked him in. No, I never did that. (laughs) But the moment I watched his eyes go down and up, my eyes made contact with his eyes. And I gave him a look that let him know that I was not impressed with him checking out my wife. I was very, very ticked off that he had done that. Later on... Within the next 24 hours, I can't even remember where we were. Another individual looks at Ainsley, and I see, I look at the eyes, and I watch again, and I, I, I know it, was, it was as we entered the airport. I watch this person who's sitting down, and they see my wife ahead, and I watch the eyes again, look at her, and then do a, a, a look over her, and once again, my, I'm, I'm trying to control my rage, and I'm giving this person a dirty look. I'm so upset. Then we get to the counter. I'm standing right beside my wife. We're about to check in the bag. The guy at the counter starts talking to Ainsley, and and he says, Ma'am, I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but man, do you ever look like Jennifer Aniston? And and first of all, I'm thinking, Dude, do you not know I'm standing right here? (laughs) Do you not? I am here. Like, you can see me, right? I'm, I'm right here. And, and Ainsley smiles, and she says, no, no one's ever said that, but I know she's very beautiful, and I want to thank you for the compliment. And, and he goes, oh, you're welcome. And, and I'm like, this is unbelievable. Not just the people are checking out my wife, but nobody's checking me out, right? <laughs> I never thought that. I don't, I, mean, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but but we, we leave the gate, and we start to get into line for security, And I say to Ainsley, man, you've been checked out twice, and now the guy at the gate calls you, says you look like Jennifer Aniston. I said, man, I'm traveling with a very beautiful woman, and I'm just like an average Joe. I said, I've got to feel very, and I'm making all kinds of little jokes about it, and she's like, oh, would you just leave it alone? As we continue through security, my mind's going, and I'm thinking, okay, do I feel proud that I'm married to a very beautiful woman that people's people are recognizing as beautiful i started thinking about that i thought maybe i shouldn't be as angry and then i thought but you know what there is a there is a line between somebody recognizing someone's beauty and someone doing what that guy in the starbucks did checking her out there's a line about that you you see friends every single one of us recognize beauty but there is a line between a line where you move from recognizing beauty where you step into something that God doesn't want for your life. And this is the reason why I was feeling so angry was because each of these individuals had stepped over that line. Jesus talks about about it in this this Sermon on the Mount. I want you to look in your Bibles or look up at the screen to Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30. It says, You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Jesus 
is laying out the kingdom ethics in this, in this sermon. The, the summer sermon is laying out the kingdom ethics. That they understand the law, and we've talked about this, but Jesus is laying out what the kingdom ethics are, what God expects of the people who will follow the king, Jesus Christ. And Jesus moves from not just an outward formality, an outward holiness, but he moves from the outside to the inside in this message. And he begins to lay out how we deal with sexuality, not just with regards to our spouse, but with regards to what takes place inwardly. And as we look through this passage and listen to the words that Jesus says, we begin to discover some very key principles of the kingdom ethics that we need to pay attention to. The very first thing that we need to grab hold of is the divine design. The divine design. Jesus starts off and he says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Now this, when he says you've heard it said, he's not talking about what word on the street is. People are tweeting about this. Many people have this on their Facebook. He's, he's not talking about just this, this, this concept that's just culturally cool for the moment, that's just passing through society. He's pointing to something that the crowd knows. He's pointing back to Exodus chapter 20, where the seventh commandment says, thou shalt not commit adultery. So in this moment, Jesus goes, hey, you've, you've heard this all along, all through growing up. You've been exposed to the, the Decalogue, the, the, the Ten Commandments. You, you, you've heard that you shall not commit adultery. And, and he, he reminds them of some other, they were aware of some other scriptures, not just in Exodus chapter 20, but they also remember uh, Deuteronomy 22, verse 22, and Leviticus 18, verse 20, that the Bible forbids a person sleeping with somebody who's not their spouse. Somebody who's not their spouse. He lays it out. He's like, hey, you guys need to know the law. The law teaches that you are not to commit adultery. Now, I want to pause here just for a second. Because we talked a couple weeks about this idea of the law. And we, we shared how Jesus begins before he goes into any of the kingdom ethics. Jesus starts off and he says, hey, I want you to know that I've not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill the law. And what, and what we learned that Sunday was that everything of the law, everything of the prophets pointed forward to Jesus, and everything beyond Jesus pointed back towards Jesus, that all instructions that we have with regards to moral living point to Jesus. Everything that God expects of us is found in the person of Jesus. So when we read this law, thou shalt not commit adultery, do not sleep with somebody who's not your spouse, when we read that, we are actually point that that law is pointing towards something in the character of Jesus Christ. I was sitting in my office just thinking about this concept. I thought, you know, here's Jesus who never had a dating relationship, was never engaged sexually. He was a single man, pure as anything. So how does he relate to this verse? The, the idea that we, we get from adultery is found in the Old Testament. And, and we see that there are some scriptures in the Old Testament that speak to adultery, but not in, uh, in relationship to a husband and wife, but in relationship to Israel and God. We, we see in Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 8 to 9, that there in the scriptures, Israel is called the adulterer, Judah is called the whore, and it says that they have committed adultery with stone and wood. Their, their, their unfaithfulness, their adultery is not with another individual, but it's with stone and wood, and he's referring to the gods of the pagan nations. Then in Hosea chapter 1 to 3, we see that Hosea is instructed to marry an unfaithful, immoral woman who will go off and have adultery with other people. Because God is setting up an illustration for Israel to say, hey, look, you're just like Hosea's wife. And in these verses that we read throughout the Old Testament, we see that the adultery that Israel is committing is tied to faithfulness or unfaithfulness. And so, so this, this concept of adultery is, is beyond just a physical act. It has to do with the issue of faithfulness. And when Jesus says, hey, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery, he is pointing to a law that points to himself and a character of himself, which is faithfulness. Faithfulness. The reason why we shouldn't commit adultery. The reason why we shouldn't sleep with somebody who's not our spouse. Isn't, isn't just, well, it's wrong. 
It's because it violates the faithful characteristic of God. The faithful characteristic of God. You see, when you refrain from adultery, you are committing yourself to reflecting faithfulness, the very attribute of Jesus Christ slash God. That, that's what you're committing to. When you choose not to commit adultery, you are saying, I choose to live out to reflect the very character and nature of God because all law is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. I choose to reflect his character in the attribute of faithfulness. In the attribute of faithfulness. Refraining from adultery is committing to that. So what's God's de divine design? God's divine design is a relationship where there's absolute faithfulness. God's design for marriage is where a husband and wife say, we are going to take the attribute of faithfulness that we see in God, and we're going we're to live that out in this marriage. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the faithful attribute of God, and I'm going to express it to Ainsley for the rest of my days. And Ainsley's going to take the faithful attribute of God, and she's going to express it to me. That's God's the, the divine design for marriage. This faithfulness to one another. I want you to look at this verse in, in Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. God has just taken the rib from Adam's side, and he's formed woman. And man's response is this. Then man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called <coughs> woman, for she was taken out of, my, out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. One flesh. You, you see, the design, the physical design was a rib comes out of, e, out of Adam and is put into Eve, and she, she's formed out of man. And then man declares who she is to be. She, she's woman. She's out of my flesh. And then God goes on to say that they shall become one flesh. The divine design is one flesh. Not, 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 your, not your primary partner. But listen, your spouse is not your primary partner. It's not the person that you love the most. It, it, it's not somebody, somebody who you prefer above everybody else. It's not the one that you're most committed to. This is the one flesh. You become one flesh. When you get married, you, you formulate one flesh. Jeff Hillier in his independence got lost. Ainsley Meyer in her independence got lost. The two of us came together and we became one flesh, divine design. And what does that one flesh consist of? It consists of faithfulness. Faithfulness. Listen, I want you to look, look at this verse, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. This is, God, this is God speaking. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is faithful. He is a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandment. God sets up what this one flesh is to look like by his covenant with Israel. He sets up and says, this is what one flesh is supposed to be. This is the divine design. I'm going to show you. I am going to be faithful to Israel. One covenant, a covenant relationship, the divine design. And he's, and he's laying this out not just as his commitment to Israel, but to say to every marriage, you are to model what I'm modeling to Israel, the divine design. So what's this word faithful mean? It means to confirm or support, to make firm, sure, lasting, establish, to nourish or foster. So, so let, me, let me bring it all together because I've shared a bunch of thoughts. God's de divine design in marriage is that we would commit as one flesh, both individuals coming together as one flesh, that we would be faithful to each other the way that God is faithful to us. And this word faithful, based upon the definition I just laid out, means two things must take place in that divine design. I must commit myself forever to Ainsley. Lasting, established, this isn't just a moment that I go, hey, you know, things are really good right now. I'm going to commit myself to you. And then, and then we go through this season where it's a little bit rocky and things aren't as, as good and, and she's angry with me and, and I'm angry with her and I'm like, okay, this is done now. I'm just going to walk on. No, God says, hey, you know what the divine design is? The divine design is that you would be faithful forever, established, firm, that I say to Ainsley, I'm in this for good. I'm in this for good. 
And not only is it to establish that foreverness, but the faithfulness also has this, this factor of nourishment, that I am going to do everything that makes her life better. That's, that's why I don't commit adultery. Not just because God says no. Not just because, not just because it'll, it, it, people will talk about me and I'll lose my job. But because my job, the divine design in marriage, is that every action that I do would bring life to who she is. That I would nourish her. That, it, that she would trust me. And that she would get life from me. This is the design of marriage, friends. And I know some of you have gone through some hardships and some of you have, have gone through divorce and I, and I, and I know, know that this is a complicated situation. And I'm, not, I'm not here to condemn or judge or anything like that. I'm here to simply state that God's divine design in marriage, the, the, what his ideal is, what he wants for marriage is that two individuals would become one flesh and they would express faithfulness that is seen in the person of God. Not for a few days, but forever established, confirmed, sperm that receives nourishing from both individuals. That's the divine design. And so Jesus says to, to the crowd, hey, hey, I've got this divine design in marriage. Then he goes on and he says, but there's not only a divine design. I want to talk to you about dangerous desires. He says, you've heard that it's, it's said that you shall not commit adultery. But I, and, and I can just see the crowd, they're like, uh-huh, oh yeah, no, we're good with that. We, we've, been, we, we've been faithful. I haven't, I haven't been sleeping with any other ladies except my, except my wife, and she hasn't been sleeping with anybody else, because we, we know that if that happens, we're going to get stoned, and that's not a good thing. So we're pretty good, and Jesus goes, but I, I want to take it a little bit further. You're, you're good on the outside, but I want to work from the inside out, and I want you to know that if you've committed lust in your heart, that you've committed adultery. Now, now Jesus isn't trying to redefine adultery. He's not trying to redefine it, but he's trying to take us a little step further. He's trying to take us deeper than the outward actions. And I can just imagine the crowd goes, he said, what? And everybody starts to look around a little uncomfortably, not too long, just in case lust comes about. But they're, but they're, they're looking around because like, this doesn't, like, they've heard about the adultery part, but now Jesus is saying, if you even look on somebody else, then you are committing adultery. What's he talking about? When Angela and I first started dating, we, we, we went out, I remember the date, August 15th, 1991. It's crazy that I know that. Uh, August 15th, 1991, we went on our first date. Played tennis, had a meal at my house, played tennis, went down to Lake Ontario in Oshawa, went to Tully's Ice Cream Shop, just walked along the boardwalk. It was a great date. That day, I really enjoyed our time together. We laughed, we talked. She told me about her desire to, to uh, she wanted to, to be with a guy that, that would love God with his whole heart, and we, like, deep spiritual conversations. I, I want you to know that despite the fact that I liked her, I didn't propose to her that night. Okay, I didn't. I, I didn't come to this place going, like, this is going really good. I'm in, I'm in now. I'm in to, to commit to her full faithfulness this forever thing where I will nourish her forever and ever. I'm, I'm in. Can, can you imagine at the end of the date, and it's like, well, this was a really good date. And I just, I just want to ask you one question. Sure, Jeff, what is it? Would you marry me? <laughs> that may have been our last date, right? That may, that may have been it. But, but, I, but I didn't have the desire. There, was, there wasn't the strong desire for that type of thing. I wasn't there yet. And so we, we had another date, and got to, I need to get to know her. I need to get to know her strengths and her weaknesses and things things that were in her heart and dreams that she had and we continued to date and we continued to date and we dated for about a year and a half and somewhere in the middle of that journey I found myself desiring her I, I found myself wanting to be with her non-stop where it was so hard to say goodnight at evening time it was so hard to go off to school knowing that we were going to be apart. I desired not just to be in her presence, but I wanted, I, I felt this strong desire that I, that I needed to commit myself to her. I mean, we were dating, but, but I, I had come to this place where all options were off. Like, like I, I was not looking anywhere else. I, was, I, I had this desire inside myself to commit to her. And so March 1st, 1993, Durham College, I set up what was going to be, I thought, a good proposal it, it 
blew apart, and it doesn't matter. Uh, but but I, I ended up proposing to her in the middle of the hallway, and we got engaged that day. And, and about eight months, nine months later, December 18th, 1993, we got married. That day, at Trinity, Trinity Church in, in Oshawa, Ontario, I stood before, before her grandfather and our family and friends and this congr uh, congregation there, and I made a commitment to her that, that the desire I had, this desire inside had, had come to full fruition, and I was willing to do what Jesus wanted of us to engage the divine design, to commit myself to her forever, so that I could nourish her for the rest of my days. That day, as I stood at the altar, I gave her my heart. Now, now you, I know people go, I'll give you my heart, and it, it just doesn't mean anything. But, but what I was saying to her is that the desire for a female companion was all hers. Was all hers. This is so important. It seems simple, but it's so important. I gave her my desires. My desires for somebody of the opposite sex, they were, belonged to her. I would, in that moment, I would commit that my desire would never be for another woman. That I would never allow my heart to start to wonder about somebody else. That I would give her my heart fully, the desires that brought me to this mo point of commitment. I would give her that, and so this was handed to her. She's in Oshawa at her sister's uh, this week. I was hoping she'd be here so I could actually give her my heart again. But... but <laughs> But she's, she's not. And so, so that day took place and she had my heart. I want you to imagine this didn't take place, but I want you just to imagine a few months later. We've been married now and we're, and, and, and if any of you are honest about the first year of marriage, m some people it goes perfect, but most people there's some, there's some bumps. Anybody say amen to that? Yeah. All right, thanks for the honesty. And so somewhere along the line, some bumps and we're trying to figure each other out, trying to figure out what it means to live together and all that. And I, I'm out, and I'm, I'm just going through a mall, and I see somebody of the opposite sex who's very pretty. Now, friends, listen. I said this at the beginning. There is nothing wrong with a guy recognizing somebody else is beautiful. There's nothing wrong with a female recognizing that a guy is very good looking. We, we, this is the way we're designed. But there is something wrong when I go, that girl's beautiful, I don't look once, but I look again. And, and I want you to imagine that my desire has been to Ainsley, December 18th, 1993, I've given my heart, saying my whole desire is towards you. But in this moment, I see this good-looking girl, and I turn my head, I go, she was really pretty. Well, she was really pretty. So, and then I keep looking. And this is, the, this is what Jesus is talking about, this passage, this idea of lust. He is talking about a desire that starts to formulate in my heart. Wow, she's really beautiful. She is really beautiful. And what happens is this. I rip off part of what has been committed to Ainsley, part of my desire. It's supposed to be hers. My desire is only to be for her. But I rip off a part. I give her, like, like she's got a good chunk of my heart. She's got, she's got like 90% of my desire. Like, it's, it's theirs. Like, she's got the majority hold but just like 10%, and I start to put my desire towards somebody else. This is lust. This is what Jesus is talking about. I start to put my desire towards somebody else. And this is the thought, this is the thought that helps identify whether or not it's lust. And, and, you, may, and you may struggle with, with even formulating this and being honest with whether or not this has come into your mind. But this is what happens is I don't go, well, she's beautiful. But I think this. If I wasn't married, if I wasn't married, then I sure would like to be with her. That's what Jesus is talking about. If I wasn't married, if I haven't committed my heart towards somebody else, I take a part of my desire and I put it towards somebody else. And I think to myself, I don't say it. I, I, I don't, don't do anything. I just, in my heart, I go, if I wasn't married, then I would, I'd sure like to be with her. Jesus says, in the moment that you do that, the inside begins to express unfaithfulness. You have taken that which belongs to your spouse, and you've given it to somebody else. The inside. The inside. Now, some of us might be thinking to ourselves, well, Pastor, look, it, like we, we all struggle, we've all thought that, but it, surely it can't be that bad. Because I didn't do it. 
I didn't do anything. I mean, it's internal, it's a thought, it comes to our mind, but, but I didn't do anything. And here, here's, the, here's the reality, that, that we don't do it because we haven't been given permission. We haven't been given, my, my desires for this other girl, this other lady who's very beautiful, I think to myself, if I wasn't married, I might go on a date with her. I might, I'm, I don't know, I, my mind starts to wrestle. But I'm not doing anything because I don't have permission. First of all, I don't have permission for Ainsley to do that kind of thing. Because, because if, she, if she dare catches that kind of thinking, I'm, I'm like, friends, if my body ever goes missing, that's why. <laughs> like, like, she will kill me. She, she will. Like, it's not, she, I don't have permission from her. But secondly, I don't have permission from God. I don't have permission from God, so I don't engage in it. I, I just think it, but I don't engage because I don't have permission. But here's the thing. What if you did? What if you were given a hall pass? In 2011, there was a movie that was made. I've never seen it. just did a little research this week about it called Hall Pass. And what it was was these two couples who were struggling in their marriages. And these two, these two guys, their wives say to them, we're going to give you a hall pass. You can do whatever you want this week to see if it will help our marriage. They are giving their husbands permission to engage in what they desire. I'll pass. So let me ask you a question. I see somebody who's attractive. I rip a part of the heart that's supposed to be for my spouse, and I put it towards somebody else, and I say, if I was only not married. But I don't have permission. But what if God said, okay, go ahead. It's fine. Now, I, I know God's not going to say that, but let's just, just please just stay with me for the illustration. What if God gives me permission and says, okay, I'm going to let, let you do this? Yeah, but there's still Ainsley. But what if Ainsley says, okay, Jeff, just this week I'm going to give you a hall pass and let you do whatever you desire. I've now got permission from God. I've now got permission from Ainsley. So, so why not engage in this? The reason is, is even if I had permission, I break faithfulness. I break faithfulness. I forget the December 18th moment where I said to my wife, I'm committed to you to be faithful. The divine design, that, that my heart is yours. My desires are yours. We are one flesh. I'm here to prove to you that no matter what comes my way, I'm going to be faithful to you, faithful to you. I'm going to nourish you. That's what I'm committing to. So friends, even if I had permission, I can't do it because... I need to express the faithfulness of God to my spouse. Lust, lust is this thing in our heart that drives us to desire something that if we had permission, we would actually do. And this is what Jesus was confronting. So, some of us may think that we're doing okay because we've not engaged. The only reason why we haven't engaged is because we don't have permission. But Jesus is saying, once it's in your heart, you've actually broken the faithfulness that you committed to. You've actually broken the divine design. You're missing out what this is about. When you begin to say, if only I was not married, the only thing that prevented you from not doing it, from doing the outward, was the permission. But inwardly, you already did it. And Jesus is saying that we've got to pay attention to the inside. You see, friends, lust is this desire for somebody that if we had permission, we would actually act upon. These dangerous desires, lust that prevents a full commitment to our spouse. If we start to lust for other people, we are not giving them our complete heart. Let, let me just say this. People who are struggling with pornography, sexual media, books, you are engaging in giving your heart to somebody else and are unable to give your heart fully to your spouse. Secondly is that when you get into the sexual intimacy moments in marriage, you're going to find yourself bored with your spouse because your heart has been going elsewhere. And this is one of the things I end up counseling in, in my office with people is that they find themselves not attracted towards each other as much because one's heart has gone somewhere else and they don't understand why the intimacy is just not there. This dangerous desire will always want more. Always want more. 
What begins as just one person becomes a second person and a third person. And then it goes beyond looking at somebody just walking through a mall and it goes, I'm just going to watch a show. I'm just going to engage in something on the internet. I'm just going to buy that book. And it always will want more of this dangerous desire. Jesus, Jesus is calling us to faithfulness outwardly and inwardly. He's calling us, and if you're, if you're single, he's calling you to be faithful to your future spouse. And, and, and if God, and if God is calling, if you're, you're called to be single for the rest of your days, God's calling you just to be faithful to him. But every time we push away lust and we push away adultery, we are living in an expression of faithfulness to either our future spouse, our past spouse, our current spouse, or to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about faithfulness. Let me just say this one more thing. Adultery doesn't happen overnight. Someone like, doesn't come out of church and then drive somewhere and sees a girl and the next thing they know falls into the, the person's bed. It doesn't happen. It begins with a desire, a dangerous desire that, that we think, nobody knows about this, it's in my mind, it's in my heart. But we begin to let it play out and we think, if I wasn't married, what would it look like? And the more we entertain that, the deeper it goes and our, and our flesh begins to cry for more and we begin to engage in more and engage in more. And maybe that individual, we begin to talk to them and we begin to flirt with them and we begin to text them and then we begin to meet with them privately. And every adulterer didn't just land in someone's bed. They let dangerous desires lead them to the place of unfaithfulness. Inside out, inside out. And so we talk about this divine design. We talk about dangerous desires. And then Jesus talks about desperate measures. I want to conclude with this. Jesus said, if your right eye offends you, gouge it out. Then he talks about the hand. And friends, you, you, you may think the Bible is so pure and, and it's like it doesn't deal with real issues, but this, I'm, I'm not going to go into details, but this, this passage, both the hand and the eye, all are dealing with sexuality. And you can, you can study a little bit further to find out what, it, what it's talking about with regards to the hand, but some of you can understand it. But Jesus is saying that when your lust gets out of control, you need to gouge out your right eye or gouge out your right hand. Why right? Because right in the Hebrew language is the dominant one, the empowering one. And Jesus is saying this, whatever, whatever you are empowering to bring sin into your life, Whatever is gaining dominance over you, get rid of it. Get rid of it. He, he's, he's, being, he's using exaggeration here. He's not, he, he's not looking for a bunch of people to maim themselves. But he is declaring that it's time we get desperate. We get desperate with regards to the idea of faithfulness. In this impure world, he's saying you need to get desperate. The kingdom ethic is if you want the divine design on the outside and you want to deal with dangerous desires, then you have got to get desperate desperate measures in your life to guard to make sure that there is nothing that's going to get inside you that will produce something outside you. Dangerous, dangerous desires get shut down when we put desperate measures into place. There's a prominent evangelical speaker, and some of you know who I'm talking about, but I'm not going to mention his name by name. He's been out in the media in the last few months, very, very prominent individual who's been accused of many sexually inappropriate things meeting with female staff members in, privately in a hotel room, St being with somebody in his house that was a staff member of the opposite sex when nobody else was there, traveling internationally, making comments that were very flirtatious to people of the opposite sex, and, and sending text messages that were beyond business. And, and, and as, as I've talked with people about this, I said, regardless of how far this individual crossed the line, whether he did the sexual stuff or not, he placed himself in a spot where there were no parameters. Where there were no parameters. And there, see, there are some parameters I put in my life that sometimes people make fun of. I, I tell our staff, you need to know this, our staff are not allowed to drive with anybody of the opposite sex. That's just a rule we have. I, told, I was talking to one of our staff members this week, just said, I just want you to tell this. That, that seems foolish, but I want to put dangerous or, or desperate measures in place to make sure my staff remain pure. We, 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 I, don't, I don't text people beyond business. I, I, I do my best. Occasionally, occasionally I, I may not be bound to it as, as, much, as rigid as I should be, but, but even when I'm talking to friends of, of the opposite sex, I try to include their spouse on the text message. 
if it's not business, if we're going to get together with somebody, try to put both spouses in because I want to put desperate measures in. I, I, I want every time I'm meeting with somebody of the opposite sex, my door is open. Uh, every time I'm gone out somewhere, I want, I want the, the staff to know where I am. I want Ainsley to know that she can get a hold of me, that she's the one interruption in any meeting that I, I will take. These desperate measures in my life because I don't want to ever, I would never travel with somebody of the opposite sex. I, I would never put, be found in a hotel with somebody of the opposite sex. I'm going to put these desperate measures in my life so that, so that I don't commit adultery. And many of you would say, okay, pastor, we're on board. Like, we'll put the desperate measures so that we don't commit adultery. But Jesus doesn't say it's just about the outside. He talks about the inside, too. So here's my question. What are you putting in your life to ensure that the inside's clean also? Because it's easy to put the, the desperate measures for the outside stuff, but what about the inside stuff? What are you doing to, to show God, to show your spouse that you are committed to faithfulness inwardly when nobody's looking? And I talk with people who engage with sexual material from the level of straight-up porn to just sexuality within a TV show. And, and many people will say, well, I can handle that. I can handle it. I just, I, just, I just try to walk away. I'm going to shoot straight with you this morning because I'm just, I've dealt with way too much <laughs> in the last year or so. You can't handle it, friends. You think you can handle sexual images, you think you can handle sexual content, but the truth is your brain can't. But the enemy is deceiving you thinking that you can. There was some research that was done by Joseph Plowd, a, a criminal forensic uh, psychologist in Boston. And he began to study the influence of sexual images upon our brain. The moment you engage with any sexual image, okay, I'm, and friends, please listen, it's not just pornography. Any sexual image, your brain releases dopamine, which acts like a neurotransmitter sending signals to brain cells. So this is what happens. I'm sitting down watching TV, watching a movie, and all of a sudden there's a quick sex scene. It's only, it's only like three or four seconds. I go, oh my gosh, that was awful. But the rest of this movie is good, so I let it pass. I think, I think I can handle it. But my brain catches onto this, and there's this this chemical that's released that's creating pleasure inside of myself. And my brain recognizes the rush of the dopamine, the, the rush that brings about this pleasure, and my brain tells my body, you need to see something more. And so I, I pass by, and then I think, man, I, I need to find, I need to watch another show. And, my, and I watch it again, and my brain starts to tell me, every time you see one of those images, you're going to get a, a good pleasure. What's taking place in my brain is driving me to the next image, to the next scene, to laying in my bed thinking about something that I shouldn't be thinking about, to walking down the street unable to keep my mind pure when I'm seeing somebody of the opposite sex. And I'm going, where did this come from? How did, how did this happen in my life? I want to serve Jesus, but friends, the fact is you've not guarded yourself with desperate measures, and your brain has kicked something into place that was meant for your spouse, but is now driving you towards things that God didn't want you to see. Research also tells us that when that chemical is released, your brain actually loses attentivity, and you, you stop being attentive to the precautions that we're supposed to have in life. And so individuals who know that they shouldn't be watching certain things, shouldn't be engaged in certain things, they put their values and morals aside, not because they don't love Jesus, but because their brain is acting in a way because of the image that they saw. And then afterwards, there would be this great guilt. I, 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 I had so many times where, where people come to me and they're like, I feel so guilty from the, the, the scene that I saw. I don't know why I did it. The reason why you did it is because your brain acts like that when you see that sexually explicit material. It pushes aside the parameters that should be there and allows you to only pay attention to that which is bringing pleasure to you. And the longer that lasts, the more the cautions go aside. And friends, I'm just telling you, I know the story of so many lives where it's just one image after another. An individual sees something innocent in a TV show, and they, they want to serve Jesus, but they find themselves struggling with their thought life, and then it becomes worse and worse. And for some people, it comes into their marriage where a affair takes place. They go to a strip club. They are hooked on internet pornography. Their life is completely destroyed. 
And Jesus says, get a hold of your thoughts by putting desperate measures into your life. If you've got to gouge out your eye or cut off your hand, and what he's saying is, if you've got to get the computer out of the private place, if you've got to shut down your internet, if you've got to, if you've got to stop watching that show, if you've, got, if you've got to stop going to places that you know you're going to struggle with those things, do whatever it takes, because the faithfulness towards God and your spouse is what matters. Desperate measures. Desperate measures. Ainsley and I have this rule we, we've had it for, forever. It, b- before we ever engage in a TV show or a movie, we go to a website called IMDB. And I, I always go to parental, parental guidance to see what's in the, the show. If there's sexuality, if there's nudity, if there's, if there's nudity in that show, not a chance. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to confess this. Jeff Hillier can't handle seeing nudity. I, I, maybe you can. But, but in my flesh, I can't handle it. My mind will start to race. I'm just being honest. And the truth is that most of you, it's the same thing, whether it's a book or whether it's a TV show or whether it's a movie. And so I have to go there to ensure that what I'm about to engage in isn't going to create the dopamine effect in my brain because I'm going to want more. And I'm going to find myself, instead of thinking about Philippians 4, 8 principles, I'm going to think about things that are going to destroy my faithfulness to Ainsley. That seems like pretty, pretty extreme measures, Jeff. There isn't a TV show, there isn't a movie out there that's worth my mind. There isn't a TV show, there isn't a, a movie out there, there isn't a book out there that's worth my heart being torn up from Ainsley's hands and given to somebody else. There isn't anything, friends. And some of you, I, I know this for a fact, I know the statistics, I'm not condemning, I'm just asking you to listen to the words of Jesus. Start to put desperate measures into your life so that those things have no access to your brain. My buddy Dave, we were in a hotel in Quebec City. We were, this was years ago, and, and uh, he walked into his hotel room. He was sleeping by himself for some strange reason. His roommate wasn't there. He was pretty concerned that he was going to turn on the TV. And, and friends, if you turn on the TV at nighttime and you don't know that, the channel that you want to be on, for me, I, I memorize the sports channels if I'm going to turn it on so I'm not flipping through channels. If you don't know, you're going to flip, 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 and... And all of a sudden, the dopamine is going to kick in, and you're going to flip, flip the channel, and you're going to go, I wonder if that show's still on. Flip back. And he's sitting there, and he's like, I'm, I'm tempted. So he unplugs the cable and the TV. A couple minutes later, there's a knock at his door, and it's one of the, the staff members of the hotel. And they said, sir, some, our, our records are showing there's something wrong with your TV. And they come in, they go, oh, it, the cable's unplugged. We're sorry, we'll, we'll plug it back in. And he's like, no, 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 I unplugged it. Why would you do that? Because I don't want to watch anything that's on TV. Then just keep it off. No, it's too strong of a temptation. Then just put a blanket over it. No, I want it, I want it unplugged. And they looked at him as if he were nuts. But I'm proud of my friend because he put desperate measures in his life to ensure that he wouldn't deal with the temptation that falls into the lap of a man in a hotel room by himself. Friends, Jesus is calling us to live out faithfulness. The Christian marriage is to be a representation of the God relationship. Adultery is wrong. Sleeping with somebody who's not your spouse is wrong because it's a violation of faithfulness. And it's contrary to the very character of God. And Jesus pushes it further and he says it's not just the outside, but we start with the inside, the dangerous desires. And we've got to pay attention that when our hearts rip from our spouse's hand or our future spouse's hand, that we are giving to somebody else, we're actually already engaged in unfaithfulness in our heart. And so he says, please, 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 do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to get it out of your life, to cut it off. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Pastor Steve, would you come? I know I'm a couple minutes over, four minutes to be exact. It's been pretty quiet in here. I'm okay with that today. I don't want to deal with marriages that get destroyed. I don't want people in this congregation unable to engage in worship and unable to engage in prayer because they feel so guilty from the things that have gone through their mind and their heart. I don't want us to represent anything but what God has called us to represent. 
Today is not about judgment. Today is a day about freedom. And I'm not going to ask you to raise hands. I'm not going to do anything to center yourself out. But sir, ma'am, do whatever it takes to represent faithfulness to your spouse or your future spouse. Do whatever it takes to model the faithfulness of God. You may be single, and you may be called for sing, for, to be single and say, I'm not, I'm not breaking faithfulness. But that person you're looking at is designed for somebody. And so you're, you're thinking things that produce unfaithfulness. Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to sin, if your right eye causes you to sin, get rid of it. I'm asking as your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, that you would just say to God, God, is there anything that I'm allowing into my heart that needs to, get, that needs to go? Is there anything in my life that I just need to gouge out or cut off? I so am committed to the faithfulness of my spouse, the faithfulness of you, God. I'm just willing to do whatever it takes. And there's some of you who've joined Covenant Eyes. You wanted to be accountable to somebody. Some of you have had to move your computer to a public location. Some of you have needed to set passwords on your phone. Some of you just needed a friend just that you could talk to. I'm so proud of you for doing that. Some of you needed to do that. Find somebody who's safe and just share what you're going through. Just listen to the Holy Spirit for a few moments. One of the most godly men who ever lived on this planet was a man by the name of Job. So righteous that God said to the enemy one day, have you seen my servant Job? And no matter what the enemy threw at him, he would not curse God. But in Job chapter 31 verse 1, Job recognizes the temptation that comes along in the area of lust. And he says these words, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I might not look on another woman. And church, this morning we're going to do something so strange. As we conclude, before I give the final benediction, I'm going to ask that if you are very serious about being faithful, that you would pray this prayer after me in similar fashion to what Job may have prayed many, many years ago. Would you repeat after me? Dear God, I'm called to model faithfulness. And so today I make a covenant that I will not allow my eyes to look upon anything that will produce lust. I will do whatever I can to cut off every source of sin, every TV show, every movie, every book, every magazine, every online site. My eyes have been made to be faithful. And so today I commit to reflect your character in the attribute of faithfulness. My heart is designed for one person. May it never be ripped for somebody else. I make this covenant today in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Altar workers, if you just make your way to the front. Today you're in this place and you don't know Jesus. But you walked in, you sensed something so different. You sensed a peace and a joy and a love that you are so desperate for. That doesn't come by a program, doesn't come by doing something. It comes simply by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the one who died for your sins. You say, Pastor, I've never given my life to Jesus, but I want him in my life today. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Is there anybody in this place? Just quickly raise your hand. Just wave it at me really quick. All right. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you 
really do know that you need Jesus, I'd invite you to come to the front after I'm done praying and meet with one of our prayer team members. If you have a need of prayer and the physical need or emotional, financial, whatever it may be, this prayer team at the front, they're here just to pray with you and pray that God will step into your life. And so I'd, I'd encourage you, as soon as I finish, would you make your way out and just come to one of these individuals. Now, church, I want to pray for you as we leave this place that we would be a church of faithfulness. And so, Father, as we leave this place, this is, this is a little bit more of a challenging message. It's not that feel-good message that we sometimes take, but Jesus, you are challenging us to represent you. You fulfilled the law. And adultery violates faithfulness. And today I'm asking that you would help us to live out faithfulness. Not just outwardly, God, but inwardly too. Help us to model faithfulness. Let us not let anything in our eyes, anything in our heart, anything in our mind. Let us be realistic about what our brain does do when we see sexual images and do whatever it takes to prevent those things from happening. God, I thank you for this congregation because I know they have a desire to grow closer to you. And they have a desire to represent you so well. And I pray that you would give them the strength they need to resist every temptation. Be with them in their journey and help them to make an impact for you this week. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, everyone.